There were bumps along the way. Sure, there were some tough times, some difficult moments, but I live a good life. I'm married almost 11 years. I know you're looking at me like, wow, you're that old? Yes, I am. <laughs> I have four kids. You think four kids? Yes, four kids. Jim Gaffigan put it best when he said, let me explain to you what it's like to have four kids. Pretend you're drowning and then someone throws you a baby. <laughs> I don't have much really to worry about. I'm, I'm a pretty happy guy. I, I, I enjoy my life. I, I enjoy the things that go on in my life. I'm pretty happy. The most I have to worry about, if I'm being honest with you, is my four-year-old. Blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful kid. I told you I have four kids. I have a nine-year-old named Olivia. She is very much a drama queen. One time we were in our room with our, at the time, just our, our third child, Addison, the blonde haired, blue eyed, beautiful, worried about kid. And we were talking about how much she loved her sister, Ava, just a bit older than her. And we said, wow, isn't it amazing how much she loves her sister? Olivia leans into the room because she was standing in the hallway. She's like, well, I guess you don't need me. You have Ava. <laughs> I'm like, take it down a notch. <laughs> I also have Ava. She is my seven-year-old. She's a comedian. She's pretty funny. She makes me laugh, and, and she will imitate me, and she will, she will mock me quite often, and so I put her in a room. But, but, uh, but, but, but she is a, a great, great, funny, funny kid, and she finds herself in some pretty unique situations, like recently when she was in school, and we picked her up, and she had told us that something unique happened that day, and I asked her, well, what, what took place? She said to me, she goes, I got called down to this room. It's like a, a, a room for, for people who are having a hard time focusing in class. I'm like, why did you go there? She goes, they thought I was Ava H, and she's Ava G. And I said, oh, she goes, Dad, it was so amazing. There were trampolines. <laughs> there were so many things to do. It was so much fun. I'm like, so what did you do? She goes, I didn't tell them who I really was. <laughs> I said, why? She goes, I never wanted to leave. <laughs> That's Ava, she's a pretty funny kid. Our youngest is Nixon, my boy. I finally had my boy. He is, well, I guess we could just label him as our favorite. <laughs> it's not true, sort of. Nixon is a, a pretty energetic kid. Right now, he, he's all into dancing on tables. We're worried, but he, he loves to dance on tables and play hockey. It's a funny kid, Can't, doesn't really offer much to society yet, but he will at some point. And then there's our blonde haired, blue eyed. She's cute. She's beautiful. She's stubborn. She's confidently stubborn. And I'm afraid of her at times. <laughs> One of the issues she's had lately is she likes to steal things. She'll walk out of stores and she'll hold her stomach like this or she'll hold her leg like this and I'll say, Addison, what's wrong? She goes, I'm just tired. <laughs> Upon further investigation, we've noticed that she's taken stuff from stores. We now pat her down whenever we leave a store. <laughs> I'm not even joking when I say that we actually have her stand like this and we pat her down. She goes, I not take anything. She can't pronounce her R's. And so she, she, she's like, it's waning outside. Hurry up. I'm like, it's waning. She goes, no, it's waning. And I'm like, okay. That clarifies things. <laughs> but she'll say to me, I'll say, where did you get that? She goes, I stole it. Now, we're not really helping the situation because upon discovering that she's stolen things and we're at our car ready to go home, we don't go back in. We just leave and say, learn better next time, please. <laughs> One time she was hitting her sister, Ava, and I said to her, Addison, confidently, as a parent should be, I confidently said to her, Addison, stop hitting your sister. But confidently, she looked back at me. She says, you're next. <laughs> I love my life. I have nothing to worry about, except I sleep with one eye open from now on. <laughs> but two and a half years ago, I actually did something crazy. I did something that was outside of my norm, outside of my comfort zone, and I, I quit my job, and I decided to pursue this, this dream job, this, this dream life that I had always thought of, and it, it had been eaten away on the inside. Just do it, just do it, just do it. And so, like a good husband does, I got permission from my wife. <laughs> I stepped away from the position to pursue what I knew was a dream of mine. And it was pretty, pretty crazy. Some people thought to, actually said to me, they said, I don't really understand what you're doing. It sounds kind of crazy. And if I'm being honest with you today, when I was by myself, I actually thought I was crazy too and had no idea what I was doing. And there were some moments where things started to go in the right direction. And it was a good start. 
and I knew that you know things were starting to happen, uh, opportunities were starting to to make its way, make it be present, and I was pretty excited. It was a good start, but I knew that that start was not going to take care of my family who was at home, my wife and four kids. And that good start stayed as just a start, and I wasn't seeing any improvement, and I had goals, and I had deadlines, and I, and I knew that there were some very significant dates that I had to achieve some things so that I can actually do this and not really disappoint my family. And a few months into this journey, close to a year into this journey, I began to be a little bit discouraged. Remember, I'd wake up, and I knew I had to do something about my current situation. I knew I had to do something about what was going on, but I had no energy to. I knew there were moments where, where as, a, as a man of the house, as the one who, who's pursuing his dream, I had to do something about it. But if I'm being honest with you, even the sunniest of days seemed dark to me. And I wasn't too sure how I was going to do what I was supposed to do. <clears throat> there came a moment, though, a pivotal moment where things began to change in the right direction. I dropped my kids off at school and I drove past the home that was being built for us. And I went for a drive with a friend of mine. And... We drove past the house that I'm supposed to move into in a few months, and I still have no steady job, still no steady income, and I start hearing the voices saying, you're crazy, why are you leaving your job? I had this conversation, and it was hard for me to, to really explain what was going on, because when most people look at me, they see the funny guy, they see the, the encourager, they see the happy guy, and, and everything's supposed to be okay with that person. So how do you speak up when the identity that people have of you is you're supposed to be happy? You're supposed to be okay. This one day, I found myself driving in the car with my friend. And he asked me this question, very specific. He said, how are you doing? And it was in that moment I had a decision to make whether I would just say good or I'm okay or I'm fine. or like, well, you know, it has its ups and downs. Or if I was actually going to be honest and begin to share what was actually going on inside of my life. Mm -hmm. I began to say, if I'm honest with you, I feel like a failure. If I'm being honest with you, I feel like I've been forgotten. If I'm being honest with you, I, I really don't want to continue anymore because this is really hurting. And I feel like I've let my family down and my friends down. And I, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I was so thankful in that moment that my friend didn't interrupt me. My friend just listened. Allowed me to finish what I had to say. Allowed me to get everything out that needed to be shared. And in that moment, I was able to unload all of this pain and frustration and, and explain how I felt and explain my circumstances and when I was finished, he began to speak some words of encouragement into my life and promised that he would be with me through this journey as long as it took and walk with me. And I began to realize as I began to share more and more and more that as the more I shared, the more I felt a little bit more hope, yeah. a little bit more encouraged. Some more opportunities started to happen and some more more, more opportunities start to present itself, allowing me to do what I had pursued, the dream that I had pursued. And I began to share my story, similar to what I've done today. And I started to notice something, that my story started to impact other people. My story started to impact those who were struggling. Their story might have been different than mine, but, but it resonated in their heart. And say, if he can get through, then maybe I can get through too. I would meet students, and I'm so passionate about, about students and, and seeing them succeed and, and achieve their full potential. And I'd have students come to me with tears in their eyes, tell me, thank you so much for your honesty, because I haven't heard anybody be honest with me yet. And I needed it. I started to look around at my situation and start to realize the power of a story. And then the next few moments that I have with you, and I promise you I won't be long, but I want you to understand this morning that, that there are two questions that I have to ask you. Mm -hmm. There are two very important questions that I need you to answer today. The first one is this, what is your story? Well, what is the story inside your life? What is the story about you that if someone were to, to, to sit down with you and begin to write out your story, what details would they find? And I realized this, realized this, the first thing is this, that every story needs an author. That without an author, there will be no story written. But if you don't speak up and share your story, no one will ever have an opportunity to hear your story. The second thing is this, that every story needs a reader or a listener. Mm -hmm. 
And so maybe you've shared your story or maybe you, maybe you haven't shared your story. But if you don't feel like sharing your story, you already have shared your story. Please hear me. You also need to become a, a reader or a listener to somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. Because what good is somebody telling their story if there's nobody to listen to? So we need some authors in this place, but we also need some readers in this place. If you're wondering about how you could share your story and what's included in your story, I've realized that there are three very important things that should be a part of every person's story. First is the past. Some of us don't like to look at our past because it hurts. Some of us don't like to think about our past because the pain is so real. But I need you to understand that your past is important because it's something you've already gone through. And if you've already gone through it, it means you've already overcome once before. If you've already gone through something, it means you've already been victorious before. And it tells me this, that you can also be victorious again. Yeah. So our past is important. <laughs> but not only that, your past needs to be shared because other people need to know what you've gone through. Because if all you do is say that life is perfect and life is great, you've had no trouble along the way. It would be hard for people to see what you've been through and encourage them to get through it as well. The other thing we need is our present. We're living in it right now. And for some of us in this place, our present hurts. For some of you in this room, your present is filled with pain. Emotional pain, physical pain. Whatever pain it is, we, we live with this present pain. For some of you, your present is not that. Your present is an exciting one because you've already overcome the pain. But both of your present stories are needed. Your present reality allows us to be informed about where, you're, where you currently are. Your present story informs other people to, to, to know what's really going on. And, and people can come alongside you in your present situation and help you and help others because we now understand where they are. If you don't share your present situation, your present circumstance, your present story, it's hard for someone to come alongside you and walk with you through this journey. Third thing that's very important with our story is the future. <clears throat> the future is so important because it's what you're fighting for. The future is important because it's the goal you have in mind and that you want that, that future, that future reality, you want it to eventually become your present reality. And when you know what you're fighting for, it allows you to keep going through your present situation. When you know what you're fighting toward, what you're going towards, the future that you're fighting for, it allows you to embrace the moment even though it hurts. Even though it's not what you want. But it's getting you to where you want to be. I spoke with a student recently who told me, she, I feel like giving up. I feel like giving up. I keep doing this and I keep doing that. And I keep messing up and all of this and all that. I said, what's your future look like? She said, I'm not sure. I said, tell me, what does your future look like? Because until you know what your future is supposed to look like, it'll, it'll be hard for you to keep fighting to get to it. That's good. So I told her, I asked her, what's your future? And she began to write down what her future looked like. And for her, it was simple. She goes, I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, let's walk together in this journey and make sure that you find that present future of being happy. That present situation of being happy. So we need a past. We need a present. We need a future to be told. But why? why? Why is your story important? Why, why is your story needed? First of all, it helps the author. It helps you. Because if all we do is keep quiet and keep silent about it, thinking, well, I can't share this and I can't share that, we're going to continue the same struggle over and over and over and over again. And tomorrow will be just like today, and the day after will be just like today, because we're not seeing any signs of hope because all we're doing is holding on to the pain. So we need to tell our story to help ourselves. We also need to tell our stories so that we can inform the reader. Because the reader needs to know where you're at so they can properly walk with you through this journey. The third reason why you need to share your story is because your story needs to encourage future authors. There are some authors, unwritten, unpublished authors right now, who have a story that needs to be told. This world needs their story. And until you share your story, they won't ever be encouraged to share their story. So you need to share yours because your, your story encourages the future authors that are unpublished. Still. 
There's always an obstacle to sharing our story. One of the main obstacles I've seen is, well, my story isn't as serious as that person's story, so why share mine? And if all we ever do is compare our story to somebody else's story, we'll find reasons not to share our story. I need you to understand every story is different, but every story is needed. So my first question to you this morning was, what's your story? My second question is, why aren't you sharing it yet? Thank you. Welcome, Brayden. Thank you. I want to invite my friend Steve Osmond, who is a business coach, up to the stage. Stand up. <laughs> 